Welcome to the Mindset Advantage podcast with Dr. Trisha Cardner and Elliot Rowe. So, Trisha, introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. It's Dr. Trisha Cardner, the author of Positive Poker, and I have a new chapter on mental toughness in excelling at No Limit Hold'em. And my name is Elliot Rowe. I'm a mindset coach and hypnotherapist for poker players and UFC fighters. So, Trisha, what news do you have for us today? Well, I just read a really interesting article. It was published in the journal called Frontiers in Human Neuroscience. So it's a very fancy journal. And basically, they were looking at which sleep habits in particular can help with things like self-control. And I'm really interested in self-control and self-discipline because I guess it's the part of the brain or it's the attribute that humans have that can help us make good decisions. But when we're running low on it, we can unfortunately get into some bad spots. And what they found is they found that if you have sleep deficiencies, they're going to interfere with decision-making capabilities generally, but specifically self-control. And I know this may not sound earth-shattering to people, but the idea is that you need to get good sleep habits. And the ones that they found that were the most helpful in promoting good self-control was going to bed at the same time every night, avoiding caffeine late in the day, and allowing time to mentally wind down before you go to sleep. So if you would get in the habit of doing these things, you're going to actually increase self-control, which can help you at the table. Excellent. And um, it's actually really important one. I, I get a lot of people talking about sleep. There are a lot of poker players out there trying to cut their amount of sleep down to get more in the day. And, um, you know, that can be a big issue. I've had people arguing that they want to only get four hours of sleep a day. And the, the reality is without the sleep, you're not going to play well. So, so those hours are just wasted. You know, and the other thing, too, that they mentioned in this particular study is that lack of sleep, besides decreasing self-control, it also increases hostility. So you could see that, you know, affecting you at the table for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, guys, get to bed early. Turn your computer screens off an hour before you go to bed. That's exactly right. There you go. So some new rules. Okay, so today we have David Tuckman coming on. He commentates for the World Series of Poker and a number of other events. And he's going to talk about being a professional poker player and the things he's learned about the mental game from uh, all of his years of commentary. So let's give David a call. So hi, David. Thanks for coming on the show. If you could just introduce yourself to our listeners. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm David Tuckman. You might know me from doing the World Series of Poker commentary. I'm a professional poker player in, uh, in the times that I'm not in the booth doing commentary, whether it be for EPTs or World Series or Poker Night in America or whatever else I'm doing, I play a ton of poker. So there you have it. So for our listeners' benefit, do you play cash, MTTs, a combination? What levels do you play at? That sort of thing. Uh, I primarily play cash games, and I'm one of the lead pros for CrushLivePoker.com. And of course, I've had you on, on our podcast over there. It was great. But primarily, I would say I play 99% cash. I maybe play five to six multi table tournaments a year, the World Series of Poker main event being one of them. But generally speaking, I, I do play cash games. And I've been playing for, God, I've been playing for my entire life. I mean, I grew up playing behind my dad, sitting watching my dad play stud. And how long have you been playing for? So I've been playing poker for as long as I can remember. But I've been playing professionally since 2004 is when I started playing professionally. I started a job. I got a job as a prop at the Bicycle Casino in L.A. in January of 2014. And I have been making a significant portion of my income from poker ever since, since then. Primarily now playing 5-10 no limit hold'em. And I mean, that's almost from the sort of the beginning of the boom. How have you seen the game evolve over that period? The game has definitely changed a lot. I mean, I started playing, you know, Limit. But I think as the game has evolved, I have evolved as well. I mean, I look back at David Tuckman 10, 11 years ago, and I, I kind of almost grimace at how bad I must have been. But I was good enough relative to the competition that I was able to make a living doing it. But I've had to improve, you know, tenfold. And I wish somehow I could have the knowledge I have today, you know, but obviously, you know, the game evolved and we all evolved. But, you know... The funny thing is I hear all the time how people say, like, oh, no limit Holman is dead now. The boom is over. You can't make the easy money anymore. And I tend to disagree because I see it on a daily basis in the casinos that I play in. There's still plenty of really, really bad players out there. It just takes work. Where I think maybe 10, 15 years ago, people would just give you money. 
I think now you've got to put a little bit more work and a little bit more time into your game, and so the fruit, you know, so the uh, the tree will bear fruit. So talk about that for a second. What kind of things do you think people, players, need to do to put that time and put that work into their game? Um, I mean, I think playing is number one. you got to have the experience because it's funny. My dad came out to play in the seniors event, and my dad hasn't really played poker in many years. He plays a little bit, but he plays, he plays gin now. And I think one of my dad's biggest problems is because he had no experience really playing Hold'em, and especially no limit Hold'em in tournaments, he didn't even know what questions to ask. And I think that's one of the biggest problems. You can go on these training sites and you can read books, but without the experience, nothing's going to help you because you don't even know what questions to ask, and you don't know what, what issues you will have. So playing number one. But I really think, like anything that you would do in life, if you want to play basketball, just playing the game, or if you let's say you play golf and all you do is play... I think if you never hit the driving range or never went on the putting green, your game would suffer a little bit. So you've got to put the time in. And for me, it's a matter of watching videos. And because I'm able to actually do videos, I think just doing the videos really helps me as well. I talk to my friends all the time about poker. I listen to podcasts. I try to read books. I do tend to think that sometimes theory books are really, really good. But I think sometimes when you get into like specifics in books, that can get it can get stuff can get dated really, really quick. So you've got to be careful with that. But I think at the end of the day, for me at least, it goes down to you know, don't show me where the fish are, just teach me how to fish, and I'll be able to develop it from there. And with that sort of evolution in your game, have you seen the, the sort of the mental side of the game become more important? Yeah, I mean I've noticed that from the start. And I think it was one of my weakest aspects of my game early on. And I was fortunate enough that I started doing commentary with Live at the Bike many years ago. And I noticed that there were a lot of players that I thought were really good when it came to, like, technical aspects of the game. You know, the mathematical parts of the game. Yet I noticed that they were still losing players. I mean, they'd win 80 or 90% of their sessions, but they'd still be losers overall. And I don't mean losers in general. Whether they might have been losers, I don't know. But you know what I mean, losing players. <laughs> but uh, that was my, my bad attempt at you. Feel free to laugh. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. The polite laughter in the class. Or, you know, even back then, I noticed that really, really good players were still losing because they lost. Can I curse? Well, can I, if, can you, I use can I, if you do, then we have to slap this with the old explicit label, which may get us one to two fewer listeners. <laughs> okay, then I will. Then I'll say they lose their mind for a second, you know, and I saw them lose their mind and not play their optimal game. And I, I very quickly realized I was like, and also being a prop, I was there 40 hours a week playing poker, and I noticed that my emotions would go, you know, like a roller coaster. So, and the more I play, the more I realize that the game is like maybe even more than 50% mental, especially now that there are so many good players out there technically. And the funny thing is that a lot of professionals that I talk to with now in LA, they look at a game and they go, yeah, it's got so many regs in there, you know, so many pros. And I'm like, yeah, but these three pros, if they start losing, they get really, really bad really quick. So I think a lot of the money that you can make today in poker is just basically playing against players that are normally pretty good, but they go on tilt 15 to 20% of the time and just recognizing when they're on tilt and taking advantage of it. Would you advocate doing things to put them on tilt if you know that'll take them away from their technical game? Fortunately, I'm annoying enough that I don't have to <laughs> and do anything actively. It just comes naturally for me. I mean, I'll put it this way. If I take slightly the worst of a play, let's say, instead of a play being over 50% EV, it's like 45%. But I know that if I give my opponent a bad beat, he's going to reach in his pocket for a few thousand buy-ins, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's worth it, you know what I mean? So you take slightly the worst of it, but... So today I lose a little bit of money to the guy, but over the long run, he's going to get crushed because every time I beat him here, He's going to go on tilt and lose two or three more buy-ins. Maybe there's something to it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to advocate being a jerk because that doesn't make the game friendly. But I think there are things you can do to try to get somebody off of their game a little bit in a fun jerk-like way. 
did you work specifically on your mental game to reach that sort of level? Um, not as much as I'd like to, to be honest with you. And in fact, you know, I, I'd actually love to get a coach like you or, or, or Dr. Gardner, simply because I, I think it's an underrated aspect of the game. For me, it was just a matter of playing so much. And I think being in the commentary booth really helped me with perspective. And there are times where when I'm playing poker, what I try to do is I try to remove myself from the situation and imagine that I was commentating on this particular game. And I try to imagine, okay, what would I say if I was in the commentary booth watching this hand? Excellent. And that's worked for me. Yeah. yeah, it's really worked for me because it's something very personal. And because I've been in the commentary booth for so many thousands of hours, I'm able to do that. But, I mean, honestly, I, I think, especially in today's day and age where the players are so good technically, I think the mental aspect of the game is what separates the great from the good. And I feel like you, because you are in the commentating booth, you do get to see the best of the best. So if you're saying the mental game is the linchpin, then everybody should just take that to the bank, right? Well, yeah, because it's not just, I mean, it's not just a matter of getting a hold of your own emotions mm -hmm. and being able to harness that so we can make the best decisions possible. But it's a matter of also having an understanding. I mean, the game is it's a people game. We're playing people versus people, right? So it's a matter of understanding the psychology of what's going on. You know, so when I sit down at the table, it's not just, I mean, I don't want to talk about, like, sometimes I think we think mental game, we think, okay, just tilt control. It's mm -hmm. not just that. It's also, you know, understanding when your opponents are on tilt and how to, how to capitalize on that. In my understanding, it's also the psychology of the game of trying to figure out what my opponents are trying to accomplish when they make certain plays or when they make certain decisions. And if I can get behind the psychology of the game, then I'll have a much better understanding of what they're trying to do, not from a math point of view, but sometimes it's simply a guy, he finally got even. So he wants to, I know he doesn't want to go back into the, the red. You know, I, I know he wants to leave at least even today. So if I know that, and those are kind of like, I don't know if that's the mental aspect of the game, but it's clearly not the math side of it. I think it's more of the intangibles. Mm the live and tangible part of the game, but I think it all encompasses the same thing. Yeah, it's all one and the same, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I think some players, I mean, some players, if you, if you sit down in a game and you know that a player is making a decision based on a, from a place of fear, then you have a much better idea of why he's making certain plays. And on the same side, if you understand that somebody is there to gamble and normally plays a bigger game, you know, the same aspect. We understand, okay, what is he trying to accomplish? So forth and so on. You know, one thing that this brings up for me, what you're saying is I know just for some clients that I work with, sometimes for bankroll management reasons, they have to go down in stakes. And it just seems like when they go down in stakes, sometimes there will be this thought process like, oh, this should be easy or I should be able to beat these people. And I don't know, maybe their ego gets in the way. Have you ever seen anything like that? Yeah, we call it, uh, you know, it's funny, I did a podcast on this. And we call it, it's almost like winner's tilt, you can call it. I mean, in a weird way, it's like, it's this like expecting to feel entitled because yes. you're a better player. And I've seen it from players playing in the one, two games, two, five games that normally play bigger to players in the main event who are playing at a table where they know better players than the players playing at the table. And I think it's very, very common in tournaments. Yes. Pardon me. Because... There are a lot of weak players playing against very good players. And I think sometimes the really good players feel entitled to, they should be winning. So they put themselves in really, really difficult situations. And I think it takes a strong, a strong mindset to get around that fact that you're entitled to nothing. All you can do is make the best decisions based on what's going on and go in with very little expectation. And it, it'll work out fine. But, you know, if you play badly against one, two players or you play badly against five, ten players, it's probably going to bite you in the ass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very good points. Have you seen all the commentary you've done? Is there anything that really stands out to you as like a real breakdown at the table where you've seen someone just start to turn and then it just, you know, the roller coaster takes them? Oh, God, we see that every single day. Almost every day. <laughs> What's the best one? I mean, I've been trying to think of one. It's just like, it's, it's funny. We've seen, 
I mean, you can go back to the 2005 Main Event Championship when uh, Joe Ashton won the main event. Lazar, I think his name is. His last name was Lazar. Mm-hmm. And there was an into his hand where he had an ace in his hand, and he, he would have made quads had he played the hand. And in his most inane hand, his most ridiculous moment, you see him go on tilt. You see. And I can't tell you how many times it happens. And if you listen to my commentary, you'll hear it all the time where we actually sit there and I go, well, it looks like this guy could blow a, ga- a casket at any moment right now. He is going to blow up any time right now. And you see it in his body language. You see it in his mannerisms. And if you're at the poker table and you play enough live poker, it's something you definitely can capitalize on. But, you know, the time that usually happens more often than not is when a player has a lot of chips and loses a few hands. And it's suddenly now still a very healthy stack, but no longer like the dominant position he was in. And for whatever reason, mentally, I guess it's just much harder to lose those chips than it is good to gain those chips because you see a player go from, say, 500,000 chips to 350, and you can see it like it's palpable that he is about to lose it. His mind is about to blow. And on the same hand, though, if you gave a guy 250,000 chips, and he got up to 300,000, even if he had left the guy with 350, his mindset would be such a better place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I actually work with professionals a lot on this for the MTTs. And a lot of it is about accepting that those stacks are going to go up and down throughout the tournament. And no matter what happens in a hand, it's just adjusting to the new stack size that's important. And just playing the stack size as well as you can. As you say, a lot of people are just chasing to get back to their peak, but we know that's not really how the game works. Yeah, no, I mean, I think your point is, is spot on. Because if somehow we could go in with the only expectation knowing that I will have ups and downs, there will be a roller coaster ride, and just making the best decision I possibly can at each moment based on my stack size, based on my opponent's stack size, that would be great. But in reality, we human beings, for whatever reason, we do chase those. You know, if, if I'm playing a cash game and I started with $2,000 and I had it up to 5000 and a couple of hours later, I'm down to 3000 I'm still up 1000 on the day, but it feels like I'm down. Then you do need a <laughs> mental game coach. You're right, David. Yep. Sign us <laughs> up. <laughs> But I think, that's, I think that's really common. I mean, I think in tournaments, I see people doing it. I know in cash games, it's very common as well. Oh, it, yeah, it comes up all the time. It's definitely a really common issue, but it, it is also something that people don't always realize can be worked on and can be improved. I want to ask you about something that went on. We commentated the little one drop final table, and it was without doubt one of the slowest tables I've ever seen. What is your opinion about the play just slowing down so much in today's games? And what kind of factor is that in people tilting? Okay, I have. I actually was going to ask you, so I have a comment on this, and I want to throw a question back at you guys for this one. Okay, awesome. So my comment, first of all, it, it infuriates me. I think it's terrible for the game. I think it alienates amateurs. I think it stops many amateurs from wanting to play in this game. It's also... It's never really a great thing if you're a professional and there's amateurs of the game in the game that think that you're thinking that much, then suddenly they're going to start thinking. And we don't really want that. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think I, I have no problem with, like, taking a, a little bit of time with tough decisions here or there. It's the ones that really are no-brainers that I, I, think it, I, I think it's bad for the game in general. You know, we play this game because it's fun. Amateurs play this game because they want to get away from their, their spouses. They want a little bit of escapism from their lives. And they just want a little camaraderie. And they go down to the casino. They don't mind if they lose a little bit of money. But nobody wants it to feel like it's that serious and that, you know, taking that long. So I, I will say that I think, you know, the little one from one drop that you and I covered, that was a little bit of a, an outlier. <laughs> Play actually was much quicker this year as opposed to two years ago. It's actually getting better. Great. Believe it or not. Yeah, so I do think it is getting better, and I think that's great. My question to you guys is, and you are going to ask me if it puts you on tilt, is how do you stay focused? Because there are some people that make the argument that the reason I tank sometimes is because it makes my opponent less apt to three-bet me 
if they know that I, they're gonna have to, they're gonna have to like basically sit there for 45 seconds while I tank. Unfortunately, I wonder if there's some truth to that. Like, if you consciously or subconsciously avoid getting into significant confrontations with somebody who you know is going to just tank for a long time because a it's uncomfortable and b it's just infuriating and tilting. So I wonder, how do you deal with that from a player's perspective? How do you stay focused? Like sometimes it's really, really tough. To like, especially if I'm not involved in the hands, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes it's really, really tough to stay focused. That's where I want to be. When, especially if I'm at the table, I want to get as much information as I can from my other opponents. I get guys to create other games for themselves at the table. So they'll be imagining a HUD above the other players at the table. They'll be putting players on ranges in every hand and seeing how many times they're right when it goes to showdown. Basically ways of trying to keep yourself in the live game and and sort of interested in what's going on at the table at all times. Especially it's something I recommend to guys who are finding themselves playing on their phones for tournaments and things like that. So it's just a way of trying to get them completely immersed so they're picking up more and more information, but they don't have to wait until their hand to do it because they've got something that they're looking for. And the other thing, the other thing too is I think people are too reluctant to call clocks. And, you know, we didn't see anybody call a clock while we were doing the little one for one drop, and they were seeing like 13 hands an hour. Yeah, it's tough. It's a fine line because you're at a main event, final, I mean, you're at a final table of a World Series event, and a lot of people are like, well... I don't want to be disrespectful. Yeah, it, it's tough. You know, I mean, I will call the clock if somebody takes a long time with a decision. I have no problem with that. But I can understand when, you know, when people don't, you know, because it is a very antagonistic thing to do. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people don't want to, like, you know, they, they're unconfrontational. They don't want to be in that situation. Um, yeah. One thing Joe Cata said, which was actually really smart, I thought, Joe Cata said that during... Either when he finds himself emotionally losing it a little bit, or if he finds that the people at the table are tanking for a long time, and he doesn't want to call us a clock, but it's, you know, he wants to stay focused, he suggested he actually he will count everybody's stack size as closely as he possibly can. So he feels like, okay, that way he's staying engrossed in the game, and he's actually doing something that will be useful going forward. I mean, that's an excellent one. That's, you know, exactly the sort of game type thing I was talking about. You know, create a distraction that's still something that's useful to you later on on the day. Yeah, I think that's super important because you've got to keep your head in the game. And there's so many, I call it a mental checklist. And that's what I have my clients do. And it's basically very similar to the things that Elliot's talking about. Uh, And they just go through the list anytime something like this comes up. So that way they're in the zone and they're not watching, you know, TV or on their phone or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think it's amazing. I mean, in a game, in a game of incomplete information, it's amazing how much we pick up subconsciously. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my friends make fun of me because I, I really do rely on my live tells a lot. And some of them I can't really even pinpoint. It's just a matter of I feel like some of the table I'm like, I don't think you got it. Um, and I, and I, I really do believe that subconsciously I pick up a lot of things. And that, those are my instincts telling me, you know, what, you know what, what I picked up and trying to fill in basically the missing pages to this book. And if you're thinking about how many hours of poker you must have seen in your lifetime you know, with all of the professional play that you've done, but then the thousands and thousands of hours of commentary as well, you're probably better placed than virtually anyone in the world from that side. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I didn't play a lot of online poker. So, you know, I am definitely not, when it comes to the technical aspects of the game and the math side of the game, I understand them, but... There are hundreds and hundreds that are better than me in that part. But yeah, I do have a lot of experience, obviously, in the live, you know, the live area, which is what I prefer playing anyway and prefer doing commentary on. But it, it is, it's an interesting kind of a place to go in. I mean, I actually have funny, remember, remember when Open Face Chinese Poker kind of like took over the world a couple of years ago? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I got the app like everybody else did, and I was playing on my iPhone. And I started challenging some other poker players. I had, you know, David Baker and I were playing, Ray Henson and I were playing, and a bunch of guys like that. We were playing for, you know, not, not a ton, maybe $5 a point or whatever it was. But I found myself so engrossed in this game 
that I was sitting at the poker table more focused on my iPhone playing this game with somebody else than I was at the table. And I noticed differences in my actual game at the table. It was making a negative impact on my game because I was not paying attention. I was not focused on the game that I was playing it. I was instead focused on my iPhone and on the scope of my turn eight. And I actually had to make the decision to eliminate it, you know, delete the app from my phone and, and stop playing because I, I felt like it was affecting my play. That and my wife was very much against me playing at home. She said, wait, so you're going to go to the casino and play eight hours there, and then you're going to come home and play play on your iPhone as well? And she thinks that as well. She's like, okay. She's like, enough is enough. <laughs> Well, the mama bear principle in action. If mama bear is happy, everybody's happy. If mama bear ain't happy, nobody's happy. So you heard it here yeah, first. For sure. <laughs> By the way, I think that actually affects the mental game as well. I think people discount that. People don't realize how much their personal lives can affect their mental game, I think. Mm-hmm. And I actually had a client of mine, I, I coach as well, but not mental, I coach you know, poker. But I had a client of mine that, that lost her brother. And she took a little bit of time off, and then she went back and played, and she was just getting crushed. So I talked to her on the phone, and we had a really nice, long conversation about just accepting the fact that she is far more emotional than she would be under normal circumstances. And she is far closer to her emotional brink than she would be under normal circumstances. And I, I basically told her, I said, I think you're being a little naive to think that your personal life is not going to affect your poker game. And I think that goes to even, you know, if you get in a fight with your significant other, whatever reason it is, I mean, if your significant other is not not supporting you while you're playing poker, whatever it might be, I, I think people have to understand the fact that their personal lives, that can affect and that can seep into your poker game as well. It, it definitely has a huge impact. And another one in poker that, that I hear an awful lot is the um, the online player who's young and their parents are dead set against it and put a lot of pressure on them. That's definitely cost a lot of players a lot of money, the fear of what their family think about them playing the game. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. I mean, I think everything is fine when you're winning. Everything is fine when things are going well. But in poker, as you mentioned earlier, you know, there's going to be ups and downs. It's a roller coaster ride. And invariably, when you do lose, you've got to be able to deal with that emotionally. And I think if you don't have the support of your parents, your significant others, or you're just more emotional than you normally would be for whatever reason, it might be tougher to deal with those downswings. So you've been in the poker world a long time. You've seen all kinds of players come and go. I'm going to ask you a question I asked Terrence Chan. Who do you believe is the most punchable person in poker and why? Oh, wow. The most punchable person in poker? <laughs> My God. I'm not a very violent person. I mean, Terrence Chan is a puncher. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know. Gosh, <laughs> the most punchable person in poker. I guess Alan Kessler. <laughs> and, and you have to follow that up with why. <laughs> oh, do we really? I mean, really? Do we really need a reason? <laughs> why not? It's Alan Kessler. I mean, if you follow him on Twitter or 2 plus 2 I, I, or Facebook, I don't think that the, the answer of why has been needed. <laughs> yeah, and the more I think about it, I mean, Alan Kessler is, I respect him, but man, I have to imagine he is by far the most punchable person in poker. Who did Terrence Chan say? Uh, he said Russ Hamilton. Well, first he said Phil Hellmuth, and then he said, nah, nah, just kidding, it's Russ Hamilton. Yeah, I mean, I guess Russ Hamilton is, but it's, when I think of punchable, I guess my definition of a jerk, when I think of like Russ Hamilton, like, I don't want to punch him. I want to, I want him arrested. Right. I'm not that big. I'm not that big a guy. I don't think my punch is enough. <laughs> <laughs> For Russ Hamilton, he, he deserves far worse than a David Zuckman punch. But how many Kepler, like, I think of like, yeah, he's punchable. <laughs> like, you just want to knock him out of there. <laughs> and I guess on that note, that's us at the end of the, <laughs> <laughs> the, end of the episode. <laughs> So, um, David, thank you so much for coming on. Where can um, people hear your show and, and hear you commentate? Uh, well, I do commentary everywhere. And right now, like I said, I'm part of com. It's a great site that is specifically for live poker players. And, you know, our general demographic is, you know, players that play anywhere from 1 to 5, 10, know them and hold them. We also cover PLO and a little bit of 08 as well. I do a great podcast for them called Under the Gun, which uh, 
is free, and you can uh, you can download and listen to that over at CrushLockBoker.com. I do commentary everywhere. Just uh, you know, I think the next job I will do is Poker Night in America. There is a tournament up in Turning Stone, and it will be live on Twitch. I want to oh. say like August 8th and August 9th. So I am off till then. Perfect. Well, enjoy the break after the World Series and, and drive safely. And everyone, uh, go and check out David's podcast. Oh, and by the way, yeah, Lexington, Nebraska. I always mention travel tips because I love traveling the world. And I've, I have numerous ways. I, I have pointed out great places for people to go visit. Lexington, Nebraska. Cross that off your list. <laughs> if that was the place you were going to visit. That was top of my list. Yeah, it's... It, <laughs> It's about as sexy as it sounds. <laughs> so you heard it here, folks. Stay out of Lexington, Nebraska. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Cheers, David. Thank, thanks for coming on. And um, yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, anytime, anytime. Thank, Thank you. you. And that was great to have David on the show. It just shows you how much you can learn, even from just watching from the outside, from the other players. You know, what I found super interesting is that how he asks himself the question, what would I say if I was commentating about my own hand, you know, and how I played the hand? Yeah, I mean, this is a visualization technique that I've had other players do, not from a commentary point of view, but certainly looking at themselves as a third party and how how they would recommend a, f- a friend would play that same hand. So a similar sort of thing, but obviously might be easier to visualize if you're if you're not a commentator and dealing with that. But it really, if you can take the emotions out of the hand, usually it's a lot easier to then think through the decision. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, I really liked his emphasis on the fact that poker just overall is a people game. And so understanding yourself and other people at the table is like two sides of the same coin. Yeah, yeah, there's there's two sides of the mental game. There's yours and theirs. So, um, yeah, it's a really excellent interview with David, some really useful stuff. So, um, Trisha, where can people find out about you and your products? Well, you can go ahead and follow me on Twitter at Dr. Trisha Cardner, or you can go to my website, drtrishacardner.com, which is in development, but it's coming along. And um, my products are available on pokermindcoach.com. Um, I've got MP3s on there. And um, me and Trisha are also going to be doing webinars throughout the year as well. So keep an eye out on the websites for information about the webinar lessons that we're going to be offering. So yeah, we'll look forward to talking to you all next week. Until then. Bye.